right. I can say hi to Arrow. Hey, how are you doing today, Tony? Ah, there we go. There's a person's voice. I'm joyful this morning. That's what I am. Dude, I love that kind of energy. That's that's the kind of stuff that you believe in the power of choice, and your choice today is to be in a great mood. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I've been choosing the word joyful on purpose lately because that's the only way to describe how I'm feeling. <laughs> I got to tell you, Tony, I'm very proud of you with this book. And the reason being is because I've, I've been a... a a daily writer for 30 years. I've done everything humanly possible to try to get people to write themselves. And then here comes your book and it is an expression. It is emotion. It is your journey. It is, it is so much. And, and this is the kind of stuff that people need to read so they can do it themselves. Wow. Thank you for that affirmation. Wow. Wow. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. To put it out on paper, though, because it's one thing to live it, and you know the emotional changes that we go through when we're living it, but now when you relinquish it to the readers, what are you going through? Yeah, that's a rule. Now, there's, there's a good question. You know, um, ah, there is a, there's, a, there's a sense of relief, and then there's just like a, a, a bit of vulnerability I still feel, right? Because the stories, at least the memories and the, that I've crafted the stories around and the poetry that's included – are poems and memories that nobody knows that I've had. Parents, yeah. family members, friends. And so there is something to be said about like, not only is the world getting it, but even people who are in my world, like <laughs> they're getting it too. And so there's something to be said about big breath. I'm so glad I got it out. But also I hope this helps not only them understand me, but help them, un them understand themselves so much better too. And so there's this sense of like, gosh, like now there's a book out in the world that I could have used as a kid to yep. help me realize how human I was, you know? Yep. Yeah. That, and that, that goes all the way back to when I said that this is what I've been doing for the past 30 years. My wife goes, okay, all your journals, when, when you transition, we're, we're going to get rid of the, the journals, okay? And I go, no, you're not, because these books are for somebody that's well beyond me. Yes. Yes. That's it. And what, and what you know, what's interesting, a part about, a part about this is too, because Clearly, I wrote this book as an adult, but the poems that I've included, mm -hmm. yeah, the story is this. I was actually in therapy. This is a real thing, like actual like cognitive behavioral therapy, right? Dealing with some stuff. And the suppressed anger and sadness and uh, this sort of like the suppressed joy that I've had like, that was still in those poems, because I've been carrying those poems around with me forever, my therapist, this is before I wrote the book, was like, Tony, you know, that box of poems you said you've been carrying around since you were a kid, maybe it's time you went back and revisited yes. those poems. And I spent a weekend reading and crying and ripping some of them up, but it was almost like ritualistic. But I was like, oh, all of the fears that I've had about myself, everything that I've sort of been holding on to, hoarding around emotionally as an adult, they were, they've were they been here the whole time. Um, and so it was a matter of like figuring out which one of these ones led to my freedom. You know, those are the ones that I made, I'm going to include it. Man, I'll tell you what, the, now, now you've just explained the title to me. From, from, from my point of direction, the boogeyman becomes the poet. I mean, uh, the, you, you had some boogeyman moments, and then when you found your poetry, all of a sudden, you found an expression of freedom. Yes, that's exactly it. That boogeyman, for sure, you know, for readers, it, it, it's absolutely a metaphor uh, for a fear, right, of yeah. internalized racism internalized homophobia. Um, I, we grew up poor, not in poverty. I want to make that distinction, you know, distinguish. Um, single mom, my father was addicted to, to drugs, and it was a messy time. He's a wonderful, amazing, sober man now. Um, but, you know, writing uh, about that stuff during that time, but, like, I had internalized this belief that I was not great, that I was, you know, not a good person, that, you know, I needed to always be, I needed to always perform, right? I needed to perform in a safe Blackness, I need to perform straight. I needed to, you know, there was a performance that I had to just keep putting on. Uh, yeah. Mark Twain, in his, uh, in his autobiography, talked about how writers need to keep their accent. And I, in reading your book, I see your accent clearly. Because there are some sentences here that don't start with a capital letter. And your, your commas and your pauses. And I'm going, my God, I love this man. I love the way that he convinced his editor, let me do my thing. Oh, wow. Thank you. That arrow, that's exactly how it went down, too, right? And so, you know, the readers need to know I am not a, like, academically trained writer. This is the truth. I've been writing poetry as a kid, just to write poems as a kid. I do enjoy reading and stuff like that, but I don't have an MSA. And so form is what you're referring to. And this memoir and verse developed into a form because I naturally think and write poetically. 
even in my academic writing sometimes, I try to slide a little rhythm, a little alliteration. And so you're right. This is a memoir written in verse, and I broke the text up on the page with the line breaks and so that people can catch the occasional rhyme to, you know, to catch the moments when I might take my breath or to catch the really <laughs> extended metaphors. I wanted people to engage, you know, with the book, you know, beyond just reading, you know, a memoir. I was like, oh, this is, this is actually fun and engaging to read, especially yeah. for young readers. Right, who may not get anything written like this. Although, shout out to Mahogany Brown and um, Candace Elo and Elizabeth Velasquez and Elizabeth um, Acevedo, who also have written memoirs and verse. Dean Atta. Um, anyway, I just had to throw that out there. But there's a form um, that exists, and I'm so happy to have that language now. Yeah. Now, as, as a poet, and you speak the language of the poet, how do you get people to understand what you're saying? Because the, the, there are many times people will look at me and say, ah, come, come back down to where I am, man. You, you're talking way over my head. Yeah, translation is the word that pops in my head because I am a PhD person um, who I publish in, you know, peer-reviewed academic journals and words are always 13 letters long. You know, when I was writing this book and when I was engaging in this reflection, I treated it almost like an academic essay because the title of the book actually comes from a poem that I wrote maybe over a decade ago. And the last line is, and so the boogeyman became a poet. Actually, that poem is in the epilogue of this book. And I wrote it, you know, over a decade ago. And what I realized is everything that I write is always for me first, right? And then there's a moment when I I want to share it with the world. And so I wrote this book with that title in mind, and I wrote it, How Did the Boogeyman Become a Poet? Tony, how did you become so unafraid to unapologetically be who you are, right? And so that required a translation because it was like, oh, we don't need to write this in this academic context with all this fancy words. Write this for younger you. How would you want to read this? How would you want to understand how complicated the world is without explicitly saying it? How can you write about racism without really, like, writing the word, right? I think I might have written that word once. Like, how? I don't even think I used the word homophobia in the book at all, right? But, like, how can you write about this in a way where the language is accessible? Yeah, the only time that you bring anything like that up is when you, when you go in at 10.56 p.m. at night to go on AOL. And, and it was like, man, he's brave and very honest in this. But the thing about it is, though, is that you show the text messages or the IM messages, and I'm going, my God, this guy knows exactly yeah. what he's doing in this story. Yeah, yeah. I'm so glad you mentioned that. And this is the important thing about memoir, right? So this, again, this takes place, you know, spring 1999 to fall 2000. So it's a short time period in my life, 17-year-old Tony. Um, and, you know, when I had to think about like what kind of memories and things to include, I had to be very sort of strategic about that. And so, you know, um, oh, I lost my point. What was I going to say? I was very excited about that question. What did you say? <laughs> I was I was talking about when you went, went in and you you hooked up to AOL. And I think one of the funniest lines was that you oh. looked over your shoulder and you're wondering you, God would God was going to be the only one that was going to see your witness. But it was okay. Yeah. You, were, you were one year away from turning eighteen. Eighteen, yeah. <laughs> now I realize, yeah, so I got lost. I got lost in the story because I was like, wait a minute, you're, because in terms of what to include. So here's the thing, you know, I do not remember exactly every single conversation I had with someone in 1999, and so, but I have very strong, fond memories of finding chat rooms and yeah, visiting yeah. websites right around the time the internet was sort of like becoming more accessible to just people just in their homes. And I had a computer in college and I'm, you know, Google wasn't out. I think it was Yahoo at the time, but <laughs> that was the first time I was able to research information and find a community. I even think in the book, I mentioned like how, you know, the internet was the safest place for a lot of us. And what's wild is, you know, I'm, I've been married to my husband now for five years. We met, you know, almost nice. eight or nine years ago, and we met online. Like, this, the fact that the internet still continues to serve is sort of this space where there's a safe, I don't know, way to be. Uh, it's interesting. Yeah. So now what's the next book? You've got to be working on another one because uh, one, now that you've been published, man, you're, you're part of the group now. Oh, it's happening. It's happening. So I'm happy to share that I was actually offered a two book deal from Harper Collins, Captain Ticket Books and Harper Collins. And so uh, the next book is coming winter 2025. It is called Knucklehead. Yeah. And it's a collection of Yeah, it's a collection of poems to black boys and men, especially the gay ones, and the people who love us. So I tell the word, if you love me and I love you, this book is for you too. And the cool part about it is I originally wrote Knucklehead first. 
And when my uh, wonderful agent, Annie Huang at Aisha Pandey Literary, love Annie so much, when she was pitching me to publishers, we included in the proposal that I was also working on a memoir in verse called How the Boogeyman Became a Poet. And it wasn't until my editor, who I wound up connecting with, Ben Rosenthal at HarperCollins, was like, Tony, the memoir's got to come first, man. Like, yes. the world needs to know who you are. And so the cool thing is I embedded nuggets in How the Boogeyman Became a Poet that directly connects to Knucklehead <sighs> and Nuggets and Knucklehead that directly connects to How the Boogeyman Became a Poet. So these two are huge. They complement each other very, very well. As my agent says, Tony, it's like, it's like the book is like the flesh, but the poetry collection is the bone. <laughs> um, and they fit together. So I'm really excited about that, but it's called Knucklehead, yeah. Well, I expect to talk to you next year then in 2025 about Knucklehead. Let's do it. Let's do it. <laughs> Dude, please come back to this show anytime in the future. The door is always going to be open for you. Thank you so much, Ira. I've had a wonderful time, man. Take care. Well, you be brilliant today, okay? Or oh, wait, wait, wait. You be joyful all day today and hey! forward. There we go. I shall be joyful. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, guys.